That's how I started Global Tech. I had a couple boxes of headsets laying around and I thought I want to burn these because I had a bad experience with the manufacturer that I was working for at that time. And I thought, you know what, let me just see if I could sell this. So I called a couple clients and they say, you know what, we want that come down to our offices. And I ended up, they wanted more than what I had. And I thought, hmm, this could be a business. So how do I sell more? I could go to every client in the country in my car and I still won't ever reach them. So I started selling online and then that evolved into selling on Amazon. If people say passive income, if people say easy, that they're probably trying to sell you something. If something is too good to be true, damn it, just like my dad said, it is. I've talked to a TikTok influencer. I believe she was trying to get her son hell off the ground with the drop shipping business. She had a video on it and it had uh, just pallets of inventory that she could not sell and her son could not sell. These types of mixed messages that you can just sleep and it's, you know, well, money's coming in. Don't believe that. <laughs> Listening to. Welcome to What the Tech, your gateway to business strategies and tech secrets shaping today's workplace. Hey, it's Rolando coming to you live from the Blue Room here in Loudoun County, Virginia, and my buddy over there, Dave. Where are you coming in from? I don't even know where I'm at today. I'm in the same place I always am. <laughs> the safe suburbs of comfortable southern New Hampshire, a couple miles outside of the city of Boston. Yeah, just as the stone throw. It's such a nice place. I love going there. Such such good vibe, such good city. I know we were talking to a partner the other day from that area, and I told him it's uniquely Boston, New England, wherever you, when you go there, it's got its own vibe, its own people, its own way, its own lingo, you know? there's And I won't do it any justice by trying to do impressions right now. Yeah, and I won't impersonate my own people, but we were watching television last night. Sorry, we were watching a movie. And it was based in it was based in the city. And I told my wife, and I'm like, isn't it so cool that our home state is in so many movies? And she's like, there is a lot of a lot Matt of movies Damon loves here. loves doing that. Uh, the Wahlbergs and Ben Affleck. You know, he likes he likes going a little little Boston sometimes. It's fun. It's cool. Right. You guys at DC, we just get, you know, the the capital, the White House, you know, those are those are the shots that are always in there. But we don't really have an accent. There's no accent. There's no way except, you know, to just show that we're the nation's capital. So you guys have a one up on us. But right. Dave, speaking of one up, I'm so glad that today we can give sellers more than a one up. We can give them two, three, four, five levels up, especially for those that want to take side hustles because we're in a situation right now where the number of small businesses being created every year has been growing for the last couple of years since the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And I thought given that drop shipping, reselling and side hustles tend to all go together, we just share what we've learned over 20 years doing exactly just that and succeeding in the face of fierce competition. Fierce price increases when it comes to shipping, the logistics, and it, things becoming more complicated. So I'm really happy to bring this information out to the world. Yeah, for sure. It's such an interesting time with all these new businesses starting up. You know what? This episode is brought to you by Global Tech Worldwide, the technology experts. They're providing trusted, personalized IT office solutions for over 20 years. So if you're starting up a new business, you need that tech. You make sure that you check out Global Tech Worldwide out at Amazon.com slash tech. All right, indeed. And you know, we have so much information that we actually need to do a part one and part two. We would do injustice if we tried to cram it all into one episode, Dave. So part one in this episode, you're going to get the how to get started with that side hustle and what to expect, especially if you want to take that side hustle and bring a product over to Amazon. There's a lot there that a lot of folks don't know that can go right as well as go wrong, Dave. And we want to help people that are getting started on that journey, or maybe they've just started and have been stumbling and struggling a way to get out of the Amazon hell hole sometimes that you can fall into for no reason of the, or no fault of their own. It's just that Amazon, it's its own creature. Mm -hmm. And you know what? Journeys are so exciting. I got to say, we're in new journeys all the time. Oh. And, you know, I got to give big props out to Andrew Berg of Berg Advisors. He worked with us on a yeah. software consolidation project. And Andrew Berg. 
He was just an awesome person to work with. He kept the lines of communication open during that entire process. Andrew, thank you so much for your patience. Thank you for being as relentless as you are and also for allowing this opportunity to learn. Um, We definitely look forward to working with you. We look forward to working with your tribe on an upcoming project. So thank you so much. All right, Andrew, thank you very much. We appreciate your business. And you know, Dave, I just want to say this before we dive into the show. For those that want to know what part two is going to look like, let me give you just the quick 10 seconds. Part two, we will dive into the proven strategies on how to build an eight figure business that will last for years. If you're diving into the drop shipping game, the reselling game or retail arbitrage. So we got you covered in part two. But for part one, Dave, we've got to put the ground rules in place so the people that are starting off or that are moving forward at the beginning of this journey understand what we're talking about. So first, I want to clarify some terms so that you understand what we're talking about, because a lot of these terms get conflated, confused, mixed up. So we're going to help you today with some of this terminology first. So once we get that, we'll move into some strategies and what to expect. So Before we do that, Dave, I think let's give a taste of what's out there. Because what's frustrating for most before they start their journey, they're probably getting some mixed messages, mixed signals about what it's like to have a side hustle and what to do with that side hustle. Go ahead and roll that, Ori. Here's how to start selling on Amazon in 60 seconds. Here's how to sell on Amazon in 60 seconds. This is how to make money on Amazon and how complete beginners are making $100 to $700 a day with no experience. Here's step-by-step how to start an Amazon FBA business like making $10,000 a month by the end of the year. In the last 12 months, I've sold $1.2 million on Amazon. Let me show you how I'm doing it. Here is something that you could set up by the end of the day today that will make you money for years to come. Why I chose Amazon FBA as my first side hustle. You know, Dave, I'm getting ready to leave right now for lunch. I'm going to sleep the rest of the day and I'll let you take over. But if you want to, you could also sleep if you want. And I'm sure that magically money will roll in without us having to lift a finger for the rest of the day. Absolutely. I was going to have my team take the rest of the day off, you know, three, four hours a day. You know, a little fun TikTok on the side. They worked hard enough, man. It, yeah, we're, I mean, it, we're, we're cruising. It, it, the money just comes in. And you know what? I don't know these people that we pull these clips from. I don't know them personally, so I don't know what their motivation is. But I know that a lot of people that hear those messages, especially if that they're at the beginning of their journey or considering jumping into the e-commerce game and selling, drop shipping, and doing some of these things that we're going to define, when they hear this, they think it's going to be fast, quick, easy money. And it's anything but that. And I could tell you from 20 years of selling, reselling, being online as a seller, as a founder, as a CEO, there's nothing further from the truth than it's going to be quick and easy. There's things you could do and jump in right away and start making some money. But the fact that you're just going to immediately start sleeping and it just money just start pouring in, it it won't happen. It it just doesn't work that way. Uh, You know what, Dave? It probably worked that way maybe 10, I would say 15 years ago. Yeah, some days I feel like throwing up, like, you know. Uh (laughs) Uh-oh! But if you want to be in that level of success where financial freedom, like these people are saying, is going to be there, and you're making all the bookie bucks, you have to be ready to work and work as hard, if not harder, at the beginning than your regular job that that you're leaving to become a side hustle. I don't remember if it was you or someone else on our show, but they warned. They said, if people say passive income, if people say easy, that they're probably trying to sell you something. Again, like you said, we don't know these individuals, but that that's kind of the warning. If something is too good to be true, damn it. Just like my dad said, it is right. It is. And not only that, but, um, I've talked to a, a TikTok influencer. And she's got nearly a million followers. And I believe she was trying to get her uh, son hell off the ground with a, with a, with a drop shipping business on Amazon. And, and this is kind of what started me on this whole thing. Maybe we should just let people know the truth about this. And she had a video on it and it had uh, just pallets of inventory that she could not sell. 
and her son could not sell. And these types of mixed messages that you can just sleep and it's, you know, well, money's coming in. Don't believe that. Save yourself the hassle. There's a lot of other things you could do to dip your toe in the water that's low risk, that will let you validate your ideas without having pallets or crates or cartons of things that you've got in your garage that will never sell, that will never move. And you don't want to be in that position because it's, it's scary, right, Dave, when you've invested maybe a good chunk of change, opened a line of credit, maxed out your credit card to get inventory, and it is not moving. So let's define some of these terms because they all also imply slightly different strategies. So first of all, let's define what is drop shipping. Let me give you the easy way to define drop shipping. Drop shipping is essentially when you sell a product to a customer and that product is not physically sitting at your location. The classic term of drop shipping means that someone else is going to ship that product to that customer. Now, that has been conflated to also mean a business where you, maybe you have the products and it gets sent to customer. That's more direct to customer, but the drop shipping, the true essence has always been I don't have the inventory. It's in some other location that somebody owns that inventory, but at the moment I sell the product to a customer that other location will ship it to the customer on my behalf. Did I get that right, Dave, or did I miss anything on that one? I don't think you missed anything. You know, drop shippers are very important in our business. Uh, they're good at shipping, you know? So when, when a customer buys from us, if we use a drop shipper, the drop shipper's not trying to sell them direct. They're not putting their own invoicing in that packaging. Buyers still think that the product is coming from us. Legally, I mean, it is our product. We purchased it. We sold it. Um, the drop shippers are great at shipping, and a lot of them can help with uh, shipping costs because some of these drop shippers are so large that they've been able to contract some really aggressive oh, yeah. shipping fees. Yeah, they get very an advantage. No doubt. And they get very, very, very low rates. And it's a good way, Dave, for folks to also, if you're not a shipping, if you're not, not familiar with shipping, you could get up to speed very quickly. But if that's something that is a frightening prospect, drop shipping is a very good way to sell items without you or you and the helper having to do that, store things in your garage or in an office and having to have products going out from your location. It's a good first step to validate an idea. Is there demand? Do I like this product? Do I know, know enough about this product? Can a product sell? That's where you want to start if you're going into a products business. Now, let's define another term that gets thrown around a lot. Retail arbitrage. What is retail arbitrage? Retail arbitrage is simply finding a product that is available, let's say at Best Buy. It's available at a dollar store. It's available at a garage sale. Available through a liquidator that's getting rid of merchandise or through a or, or manufacturer that's doing liquidation and they sell it to a low cost, um, low cost channel. You, you go ahead and buy that inventory and then you sell it online. And that's the classic sense, whether it's on eBay, Amazon, Walmart, or your own website, that's what retail arbitrage means. And you know what, Dave, I'd never been exposed to retail arbitrage. That's not our practice. That's not what we do. And at first I was like, what is this complicated thing? It, it just, that's all it is. Getting merchandise, it's either liquidated or been discounted. And it doesn't have to be refurbished. It, it could just be in the box, but it's been discontinued. And now you're selling it back to a customer. And that's something to consider. So for part two, we're going to dive into, you know, what are some of these implications if you do that? Because there are some things you can do. You go buy it on eBay, you can sell it on Amazon, but on Amazon, there's a lot of shenanigans, rules, and even guidelines that Amazon has when it comes to different brands. So you want to stay tuned for part two about how to do that well so that you don't get into Amazon jail, so to speak. All right. 
another one. That's right. Another one on part two. Thank you, DJ Khaled. All right, let's jump into our next definition. Resell or reselling, Dave, because this is, this is what we do. This is what we've been doing for 20 years. So resell is simply you taking merchandise from, in the classic sense, from a manufacturer and you then sell it to a customer. That customer could be a business customer. That customer could be the consumer. Um, it could be anybody for that matter. And that's all that means. And within resell, there are a lot of manufacturers and brands that have agreements in place that allow you to sell that product. Now, there's other ways to also resell without an agreement. And again, in part two, we're going to get into those strategies and some of the pitfalls when you have these agreements in place. There are some, um, I'll just say, there's some things like that are called the first sale doctrine. Dave, I'm so like pumped. I can't get my words out. The first sale doctrine. And we had a guest on big props to CJ Rosenbaum of Amazon Seller Lawyers who broke this down really well for us. And it's really important if you don't know anything about reselling, the first thing you want to get educated on, Dave, is the first sale doctrine. It will protect you, so get familiar with that. And if not, reach out to somebody like CJ, who can help you understand what that means to you as you grow, because that's going to be important. The more you grow, you're going to find out that that's something you really want to be familiar with. Dave, did I miss something here on reselling? I don't think so, man. This is this is our world. You know, as a reseller, be aware, you'll have a lot of competition out there. So you'll have to come up with some of your sales and marketing tactics so that you can really bring value to the customer. Because when you are reselling, there's a lot, again, there's a lot of other folks that have access to these products. So you're going to have to be smarter than your average bear if you want to be successful. Yeah! That's right. Little John agrees with you. You better believe it. You can take a brand that everybody's looking for. I'm just going to throw one out. For us, it doesn't really mean anything. Bose, let's, for example, Bose. You can go ahead and start reselling. But without having the proper information on the implications of where you're selling it, pricing, there's all kinds of, all kinds of things that can go south if you're not aware of it. So, Dave, let's keep going in with these definitions. Wholesaling. Now, wholesaling for us means something different than I even, I've heard more recently. Wholesaling is simply buying merchandise in bulk from a manufacturer. Let's just keep Bose for an example. You buy a trailer load of merchandise from Bose because you have an agreement. And these brands generally will have what they call distribution agreements with wholesalers. Mm -hmm. And so they buy merchandise by the trailer load. Then they store that and then sell it to their channel partners, their dealers, agents, um, retail locations even. And that is the classic sense of a, a classic definition of wholesaling. Other people have defined it in different ways. But when you're talking about wholesale, there are large companies, usually distributors, as we refer to them in the channel, that buy these big trailer loads of merchandise and then sell it through other channels, dealers, authorized distributor, uh, authorized resellers, and such. And that's what wholesaling means. All right, Dave, anything that I missed here on the wholesaling side that you want to add? I think sometimes wholesaling can, you know, not always the case with distribution, but generally it is selling large volume at small margin. That's usually the case. That's why you're in business as a distributor. And if you're not moving a lot of cases, you're not really a distributor. You get to literally, it's all about volume for um, distributors slash wholesale businesses. Now you could sell in bulk on Amazon and other places, but that ne necessarily mean or imply wholesaling. Because wholesaling and the channel, as we refer to, and distributors are usually locked together. And then they sell products, again, through a lot of other smaller agents, smaller dealers, even smaller retailers that buy from them so that they can sell to their customers. All right. So that's wholesaling. Good. Now, 
We're almost done here with these terms. B2B on Amazon. What does that mean? B2B on Amazon. What? What? That's right, John. Little John, let me tell you. What? What? Little, so let me tell you. B2B on Amazon is selling business to business and usually, or actually not usually, but all the time selling to Amazon registered businesses. What that means is our company, Global Tech Worldwide, if we're on there as a seller, I can sell to other businesses like Cleveland Clinic, Ford, the Ford Motor Company, Toyota Motor Company. I'm just making some of these names because they're clients of ours that we've sold to. Um, we sold to a bunch of couple of the manufacturers, um, a couple of the farmers. Uh, I can't, so like Merck and Bayer, um, as well as educational customers, they're considered uh, B2B or businesses on Amazon. So any government entity is, falls under that branch of business to business. Now, business to business transactions doesn't necessarily mean that you're selling, you know, at pennies over your cost. It just simply means you're selling to another business. Now, it is the case that there are businesses that will buy large volumes on Amazon. And those businesses are not wholesalers. Those are end users who then send the product to all their remote workers. For example, if it's one of the uh, Ford Motor Company, one of these to Toyota, they have a bunch of workers that work outside of the plant and factory. They will buy 100 units of something they get to their location and then they you know distribute that product so b2b is a good way to also find a, a channel for customers because there are many there's thousands tens of thousands of businesses and government institutions on the amazon platform registered as businesses so if that's if you haven't considered that or that hasn't been part of your game plan you definitely want to start thinking about how to do that because from the government all the way to the Toyota Motor Company, they buy everything from toilet paper to electronics to janitorial supplies to arts and crafts, all of the stuff in between that you, that you can imagine is used by a business, it will be consumed in, and purchased on Amazon. So B2B on Amazon. You know, something I just want to add, there is a lot of business buying happening on Amazon. You know, Buyers aren't always waiting for a phone call from a hardware supplier. No they doubt. They can do a lot of their, their own research. But what I love about B2B for our customers, first, it's opened up the doors for just a, another, another avenue for, um, for sales. It gives, that, it gives that buyer an opportunity to flex their buying capacity. So they might get a, they might get a slight discount. You know, because their, their buying power is greater than just a everyday consumer. But also, this is where you can really flex the value of your solution and the value of your brand. Because there's a lot of support that uh, B2B buyers like to, uh, like to expo be exposed to. So it opens up a, a whole new marketplace. And again, it gives you a, a real chance to shine as a brand to show what else you can bring. Not in terms of product, but more in terms of the support and why you want to do business with that particular seller. The, also consider your solutions that you're selling. Our market happens to be products that fit in a consumer and also a commercial marketplace. Uh, I don't know what, what it would be like selling just general office supplies or toilet paper or cleaning supplies, but I know with business grade uh, communication products like the, the products that we sell, we've had a lot of success here on the B2B side. Yeah! Absolutely, Thanks, Dave. Little John agrees. Yeah, it's been successful. And that's something we're going to cover in part two. What happens to resellers when they start growing from 5,000 to 10,000 to 100,000 to a million to millions of dollars? Because when you start reselling, I guarantee you, you're going to get calls from the manufacturer at some point some really good ones to say, great job. And some that sound like they want to rub you right out of the existence and be like, step aside, son, we can handle it from here. And we got a lot of stories around that that we can share on part that we will share in part two, because it is important. You grow your business just like anything else. I don't know. Was it, was it, um, 
Was it JC that said more money? Who was it that coined more money, more problems? Was that Big Daddy? Uh, uh, no, I think it was. Yeah, I think it was Biggie. Biggie? Or Hold Puff. on. Is Biggie Puff in the Daddy. house? Hold on a second. Let me see if Biggie's in the house. I thought I saw, I saw money, Biggie somewhere. He may problems. be somewhere in here. It's uh, either Biggie or it's Puff. A Puff? It's Puff Daddy? Come on. Come on. Come on. Well, that's all right. Come on, man. Come on. Come on. That's Puff Daddy. Uh, more money, more problems. That is a real thing. It is real. Um, and we could tell you from experience, well, the more you sell, the more attention in a good way you're going to get from the manufacturer that you're reselling. But at the same time, it, there are potential, there's potential for things to go sideways or south if they don't have a clear roadmap on Amazon. That's the caveat. If the manufacturer you're working with doesn't have a clear understanding and roadmap on how they want to be on Amazon, I guarantee you, you're going to run into issues. So how do you know that? How do you know if they do? We're going to cover it in part two. All right, let's move on. Listing. What is a listing? If you've never heard that word, let me help you here. A listing is a page on Amazon that contains your product. It contains the images. It contains the description. It contains the video. So when you go to Amazon and, you, and you're searching, you're going to get search results at first if you're typing in some keywords. And then once you click on that, it takes you automatically into a page where you see the product and you can check out. That is what a listing is. So a listing. Now, let's go to the next one. Transparency program. Let me tell you why this is going to be important if you're planning on selling or I should say reselling or drop shipping or doing any retail arbitrage on Amazon. The transparency program is meant to protect brands from counterfeit. And the transparency program also serves to keep out uh, counterfeiters and hijackers off the listings. So if you remember, listings is the product page. It will, is designed to keep them off of that because this particular brand has encountered problems in the past. So if you go and sell, like our, like I'd said before, you go, let's say go buy Bose and you buy it somewhere at liquidation prices, you may find yourself when you go back on Amazon to sell that product, if you take the product and you attach it to an existing listing that's branded Bose, you may find that you can't sell that product because of this transparency program that Amazon has in place with a company like Bose. And they have a lot of brands that have been doing this program. There's a lot more to it, but suffice to say, the transparency program serves brands in one way, where it does protect them from counterfeiters, and it also is meant, um, it, or, or I should say, for sellers that are not in, not part of the transparency program, because a brand can essentially let you into that program with them, or you'll be on the sidelines. So it's really important. That's why starting slow. Finding out if, if you can put these online, these products online without any issues is going to work for you or not. And by the way, Dave, there's also a way for you to sell without the worry of a transparency program. But again, we're going to cover that in part two. The last one, the coup de gras, the keys to the kingdom, Dave, the keys to the kingdom. Brand registry. Without brand registry, it is awfully difficult to succeed on Amazon. All the tools, all the insights, all of the investments that Amazon is making with AI and analytics, the only way to unlock that is to have brand registry on Amazon. What is brand registry? Simply put, you go to Amazon and you tell them, hey, I have a brand name. This could be the name of your company, for example, like for us, Global Tech Worldwide. That name is trademarked by the patent office. So then we can go over to Amazon, give them those uh, documents, and they have an Amazon Accelerator program. If, you have not, if you're not familiar with that and you haven't done that, that will walk you through that. There's also uh, attorneys like Amazon sellers, lawyer, CJ and company, they will help you with that if you need and others out there. 
But with that, you have the ability to apply for a brand registry program and you have the ability to unlock the keys to the kingdom. And here's where you can do more than folks that aren't part of the Amazon brand registry program. So if you're starting out, you want to have this in the back of your mind. You want to try to get your name trademarked uh, through the patent office because then you can apply for this. What does this mean to you as a reseller? As a reseller, that means that a couple of things. One, you have listings with your own company name on it. And eventually what I would say, hey, you know what? Ori, give me pro tip numero uno. Get ready for a pro tip. Once you get registered for brand registry and it's accepted, you're accepted into the program, you have a path that will allow you to take control over your listings. When you start off, you may not have brand registry and you probably will go in and uh, list yourself, essentially list yourself under other brands so that you can sell their product. You may have some success early on doing that, but to really grow, to grow your business on Amazon, you want, you absolutely want to leverage brand registry because then you can, you can use ads that are pointing to your listings. You can look at the analytics that give you further insights. You can also unlock other programs that are within Amazon, but only available if you have brand registry. So if you don't, you're going to be looking from the outside in at all times when you're on the Amazon platform. If you're a brand registered, you'll have those keys to the kingdom so that you can unlock the growth that you really want to have when you're selling on Amazon. Okay, Dave, did I miss anything here? Or did we cover all the essentials of these terms and definitions before we go into the meat? So it sounds like trademarking your brand, if you plan on being, being on brand registry, trademarking your brand is one of those first most important steps that you'll need to make. Absolutely. Absolutely. And even if it's not done on day one, it's something that you should have in the back of your mind or have a game plan around because that's what's going to allow you to really excel. Um, as a reseller, you eventually want to have a mechanism to have your own trademark or your own brand on Amazon so that you can control your own listings. Otherwise, you're beholden to listings that where you can get yanked or where the, um, the, the brand all of a sudden registers as trend as a listing as a transparency listing you're out of luck unless you get um, essentially into the fold with them and sometimes brands are very hostile to other sellers mm -hmm. so you may find yourself on the wrong end of the stick uh, if you don't go down the brand registry road so good tip for all of those starting out or that haven't done it yet all right rolando so getting started on amazon mm -hmm. so global tech worldwide how long, how many years have we been on Amazon? I want to say we're going in our 12th year on Amazon. All right. But we've been in business for 20 years. Correct. The products and the solutions. So you, on your own, you had eight years of experience working with the products and the brands that you brought into Amazon. So you started with something that you already knew, something that you had a passion for. Right. And that's, that's usually the best place to start, Dave. Because if, if I would have gone into selling cosmetics or home goods, I mean, I can cook, but I'd, I know nothing about pots and pans. I'm just saying, or cosmetics, forget the cosmetics. I know that women buy cosmetics and therefore maybe I could get into cosmetics and selling that online would have been a bad idea for me. <laughs> so I'm, I'm glad, I'm glad. So, so what you're talking about is continuing that, uh, that knowledge, that knowledge set and going into something that you know, because that's usually what I would say one of the key differentiators when it comes to folks that have success and the folks that really crash and burn. You could go to Alibaba, buy something for 50 cents, and then hope and pray that you're on page one of Amazon and that you sell tons of units. That's also being sold and pitched in a lot of these online ads and and influencers and people selling courses. It doesn't happen that way. And then, and for sellers that are, that are selling seven, eight figures and above, 
It doesn't happen magically. It, there is no magic, by the way, Dave. There is no magic on Amazon. The magic is the hard work. And the magic is the mastery of the different areas that are required to succeed on Amazon. And that's work. You go mm -hmm. back to it. Work. Right? And you know, Dave, there, there is a guy, Gary V. He's so big on this idea of getting your feet wet, go on the weekends, go get some merchandise, buy it for a dollar, two dollars, whatever it is, go to the garage sale or thrift store and start selling because this will unlock in your brain ideas, experiences, you know, the confidence that you can do it so then that you could take it to the next level. Or do we have footage on that? Where do I start? What do you mean? We're eBay completed items? Fucking, I'm going to show you. I'm, you're going to garage sales. You're like, oh shit. I see a lot of salt and pepper shakers. Then you go to filter, sold and completed items, sort, highest price. And then you're like, oh shit. $441, $600, $1,000. you are not buying this little fucking bird at a fucking garage sale if you don't know. Who bought this for $350? Salt and pepper shaker fucking collectors. <laughs> People buy everything. Everything can be flipped. Like, how do you think I figured out mug life? I I was like, I see a lot of mugs at garage sales. Do mugs sell for anything? Search on eBay mugs, completed items, sold, sort by fucking price. Holy shit, there's $88 mugs, there's $63 mugs, there's $96 mugs. Then go, buy a bunch of mugs for a quarter, come home, look them up, educate, educate, educate. The key to flip life is the homework you do during the week that you mm -hmm. fucking then leverage on Saturday when you kill it with your fucking knowledge. Absolutely. What do you mean with eBay? That's he's right. The reason, he's the reason why you want to get to these yard sales 10 minutes before, 20 minutes before they actually open. Because people like this and people that are paying attention to him, they're beating the regular casual Saturday yard sale shopper. No doubt. No doubt. And he hit it there on the, the nail on the head, Dave. Educate, educate, educate. And that's really what it's about. If you're a teacher... If you're working a corporate job and you want to get a side hustle off the ground and you want it to go beyond just a couple hundred bucks on the weekend, educate, educate yourself on the product, on the people that buy it, on where it's sold, how it's sold, because the better you understand that, the more likely you're going to succeed as you're trying to take that from just a weekend side hustle of a couple hundred, maybe a couple thousand bucks to actually a full blown business when you're making $10,000 a day, $50,000 a day or more. So start with something that you either know or you're interested in because that's going to then allow you to unlock the, oh, ah, yes, I could find this here. I could do that there. And one step leads to the next. You're confident, oh, I could do this. And that's what started with, for, for me, that's how I started Global Tech. I had a couple boxes of headsets laying around. And I thought, you know, I want to burn these because I had a bad experience with it, uh, with the manufacturer that I was working for at that time. And I thought, you know what, let me just see if this could, if I could sell this. So I called a couple of clients that I was working with and they say, you know what, we want that come down to our offices. And I ended up, they wanted more than what I had in the boxes. And I thought, hmm. This could be a business in that first sale, that first deal, then led to the next, that led to the next, that led to the next and on and on and on and on. But that first step, can I do it? Mm, yeah. Check. Uh, can I make another deal? Mm, check. And then just like Gary educate. So how do I sell more? How do we do more of this? Um, I could go to every client in the country in my car and fly and I still won't ever reach them. So at that point, then we went online started selling online. And then that evolved into selling on Amazon when none of these companies were there. And that's kind of where we are continuing and evolving our story. So we're now looking at that next phase where we're going beyond Amazon and looking at other platforms and other services that we can provide customers. But getting started, getting educated, getting the confidence, understanding the cost, you know, hey, you know, retail arbitrage, if you can buy stuff for a dollar or two or three, that's not going to break the bank. But once you start moving up and you start selling greater quantities, you're home, oh, I need more, I need more, I need more. You'll find you're going to need some financing or maybe you do have, but you're going to use it in a smart way because you're going to know I need X to meet this demand.
or the holiday season is the big season. So I do need to ramp up for right. that. Right. So you know where to deploy your cash because the cash is the hardest thing to come by. <laughs> it's the, it's the biggest constraint on the business is cash flow. So having that and lining that up and getting ready for that is really, there's an art and a science to it um, as well. Dave, were you going to say something? I was going to say first, I'm glad that we're not selling salt shakers, <laughs> um, but also, you know, you said this a while ago, you like to sell expensive premium product. Yes, indeed. You know, mar margins are tight, but it, the more expensive it is, the more money you can make. Not necessarily the more margin you can make, but the dollars are greater. And, yeah, and, it's, and it scares away a lot of other sellers, right? Yeah. When, like he's talking about salt shakers, you can find for a couple bucks and sell it for 80 or 30, you mm -hmm. know? But the reality is, yeah, you, if I could sell a salt shaker, a salt shaker for a thousand dollars, I know that there aren't going to be a lot of sellers because they're, they're afraid or put off by that price. And so, you know, a lot of focus, a lot of times early on is on the low side, low cost, low margin, uh, low sale price item, but keep an eye out for premium items because you may find that that market may be in some ways easier to sell into because there's less competition for the premium products. Yeah. So one of the other things when it comes to getting started, there's a, like, like Gary was talking about educate, educate, educate. So let me give you some of the places that I've gone to educate myself. And I would recommend to others, if you're trying to find out, okay, who is already on this path and can I learn from? I would easily recommend somebody like a Josh Hadley. He's got his own podcast, a wonderful guy. We've had him on the podcast as well. Very well versed on the Amazon world. And it's been around a while, so he understands it. Serious Sellers podcast with, uh, with Bradley Sutton. Um, the MDS podcast have been on there as well. They've got a lot of sellers that are million dollar sellers, hence the name MDS. So they've been around for a while. They understand, they understand the pitfalls and you can learn a lot from somebody that has been on a platform for seven, eight, 10 years. Uh, and you're going to, you're going to pick up something that you did not know. The other thing, Dave, selling, when you're reselling, things change, conditions change, marketplaces change. People in the organizations change. Uh, technology forces change when you're doing resell. And to stay current, to stay in a curious mindset, to continuously learn is what's going to allow your business to thrive for 20 years or more. Whatever you learn today, whenever you're listening to this video, I encourage you to keep an open mind, to stay curious and to always want to learn more because the more you keep learning and adapting, the more you realize at some point, I got to change this or this is not working and you're willing to change the game plan a little bit. I guarantee you that you're going to find a lot of folks that are going to start with you. Some may immediately rise to success, but then blink, they sink to the bottom because uh -oh. they're not willing to change marketplaces. Change. Right now we're undergoing an AI revolution and every platform that I know of is bringing it in-house one way or another to deploy it. And that will change how users interact on Amazon, on eBay, on Google, everywhere else, internally within companies. So you want to have an eye on what's happening with AI and what does it mean to my category, my business, or the platform you're trying to sell on. Yeah, without a doubt. And having a circle of connections that are in this Amazon world that aren't selling what you sell, you know, everyone's doing different types of solutions and products, but having a circle being part of different groups is going to really be a lifesaver because the rules change overnight. You know, the rules change overnight. Rolando, I remember we used to have weekly meetings and when the pandemic hit, uh, we started having daily first thing in the morning meetings because Amazon was changing the rule book overnight. Every single day there was mm -hmm. something new. And if your team, if our team wasn't coming together and all understanding what had happened and how this is affecting the business, you know, that could have really, that could have been a costly mistake. So definitely keeping, keeping your ear to the ground, 
with the Amazon, but of course, within your circle of Amazon sellers is super important. No doubt, Dave. Absolutely. I'm going to give that a clap now because that is important. Things will change. You got to be your mindset. I was going to say the mindset has to be that at some point things will change and I've got to adapt. And those folks that do that well, and the Amazon sellers that we've talked to, Dave, the ones that adapt tend to do better and tend to be um, more profitable. Yep. So be ready for that. Now, as you get on the platform, so let's just transition a little bit here, Dave. You understand this is what's going to take. You're starting them. You're doing, you're doing your Gary V suggestions of going into the garage sales and, and thrift stores and you're doing all that business. And then you're thinking, what should I do next? Okay. So if you're going to sell on Amazon, you have two directions. You have direction of shipping everything to your customer and some categories that make sense. Big bulky items like furniture are going to be different than small electronics. Okay. We understand those are differences, but in general, if you go in that direction versus sending everything into Amazon for what they have available, which is their prime pro or FBA program, which is what unlocks the prime logo on your listings and on the search results, you want to evaluate the impact that prime that logo has on your listings and on your sales. And from where we can gather in our own data, it can have anywhere from a three to 10 X result versus just what is called merchant fulfilled, meaning I have the inventory sitting at, at my warehouse and I ship it to the customer. And that's because Amazon does favor products that are in their warehouse through their FBA program and therefore allows you to have that prime logo. I will also add that as Amazon has been expanding their one and two day service in different cities and even some days same day, I've started seeing it, on, on products that I order from Amazon is that that same day, like arrives before 7, 7 PM. I'm like, I'm getting it. And what is amazing about that is that as Amazon has promised and they keep doing expanding this same day and next day program, more and more customers are becoming accustomed to that type of shipping method. Can I get it tomorrow or can I get it today? Um, and in some, some major markets, a lot more items are being shipped the same day or the following day. And so FBA unlocks that. That's really hard to do on your own when you're starting. And so if you want to get more exposure on the Amazon platform, FBA is the way to go. Now, there are some things to be aware of with FBA that does require for you to get inventory. That does inventory is an investment, which gets to what we were talking about. You want to get really familiar with the product or products that you're bringing into the Amazon warehouses because there's a lot that's going to happen there. You're going to get returns. You're going to get good, bad, sideways reviews. Amazon's going to lose stuff. Um, you're going to have to, on your own, try to get reimbursement. There's third-party companies that will do that for you as well. So there are some, some real big benefits on the platform of Amazon, primarily the Prime logo. And then there are some things that you're not, you may not like when returns, negative reviews, complications with inventory moving through Amazon system and they lose stuff. It happens. Things get damaged. That happens. Um, so you really need to think about that and what that means to you with margins. You have to factor the, if you are in the retail space, it's called shrinkage in the online space returns and those other expenses associated with that program. So, that's what I want to say about the FBA program. But for us, it's been an awesome, awesome, awesome thing. Um, but we have in place a, a team of people that work on that, on the FBA, just alone on the logistics and FBA side. And that's something as you grow, uh, you're going to find you want to do. You're going to want to think about team building. And we're going to get to that in a moment. Dave, did you want to jump in and say something about that, about well, FBA? Th well, two things about FBA. Um I think it'd be an interesting LinkedIn poll. On the B2B side, what influenced your recent purchase on Amazon? Was it fast delivery or was it low price? And I 
I think it's a misconception out there that you have to be the lowest price to be successful on Amazon. Well, we know that that's not the case. When I talk, hundred percent. You know, talking to the B two B buyers, they like Amazon because of the speed. They ship things better than anybody. I mean, of course, mistakes happen. Mm -hmm. But I think about the. I think about our marketplace, people that sell some of the brands that we sell, um, they can't be as good and as fast as, as Amazon. So when you're thinking about Amazon FBA, also consider you can retain more of your profit dollars, possibly, because it's going to get to the customer fast. We, we are going to put that as a poll out next week and we'll share our results on the next episode. Mm, I like that. I like that. And that, that, go ahead, Dave. And as you're building your team, you know what? You're going to need access to the best internet. So if you're still paying for slow, outdated business internet, you need to stop doing that. You can get instant quotes and easily compare New service with your old service. Check out circuitloops.com and get your instant quote today. That's right. Real life. That is real life. That's right, DJ Khaled. Real life. Make sure that your lifeline is nice and secure with the best possible internet. And prices keep going down. So if you haven't checked it, go to Circuit Loops and you'll be able to see if you have the best price in town or not. You know what, Dave? There are six things that every seller and every person that's looking to sell their product online should know before they start selling on platforms like Amazon. You know, the first thing about Amazon, I guess maybe seven, let's call them lucky seven. They're the magic to success on Amazon is that there is no magic. I said this earlier. Why would I say such a thing that there is no magic? There is, you know, there are tricks that people do and hacks and you can listen to all these, all the, there are black hat things that happen, but I got to tell you, Dave, you, you know, you've seen this over the years that we've been on Amazon. Somebody publishes something about a black hat. It gets shut down. Those people get busted and big problems. The accounts get suspended and all kinds of things happen when people try these short cuts that are either very questionable, you know, very borderline even, and some that are outright fraud. You want to avoid anybody that's leading you down that path. Because if you're building a business, the last thing you want is all of a sudden one day for it to be gone. And so looking at the long-term picture, setting yourself up for the long game is really what you want to do. And in order to do that, you have to think about how to master this platform because it is not like selling products on Shopify in your own store. Your own store, you don't have competition. You create your own rules. Not so on Amazon. eBay operates its own way. And I'm super curious to see what happens with TikTok Shop because they have the potential, Dave, to really upset the apple cart when it comes to Amazon. They're doing some things mm -hmm. that Walmart's not doing. Amazon, uh, Walmart doesn't have a media presence, uh, social media presence like TikTok has. Uh, eBay doesn't have that either. And because they're, they, they're not being dragged down by retail locations like a Walmart, but they have a lot more clout than an eBay, I think this is probably going to be the biggest thorn in Amazon's side in the coming months and years if TikTok starts to pull it off. They're certainly going to make things interesting. Um, I may have shared this with you recently, but my son had tried it out and I had asked him, I said, so was it fulfilled? Like it, it, it every, the, the TikTok was where he saw the product advertised where he put his credit card information and placed the order and it was delivered so fast. And I thought it was super cool because, I mean, we love video. We like doing demonstrations with video, but having all of that in the finger, just right, right in the palm of your hand, you see a demo, you like it, you see the price, you click, you buy it. It's delivered in a day or two. I know that they're just getting it off the ground. We know that they have the capital 
to keep uh, investing in that. And I uh-huh. bet it's a huge market disruptor. It is. And, you know, we're going to give it our level best and start trying it. But they don't want to see us win. That's what Amazon. That's what TikTok would say. They don't want to see us win. And I know that's Amazon trying to do their best and not not allow them to win. But I think this is a very interesting development in the last few years. This is a little different. You know, Shopify tried to compete with Amazon and bought a, a, a deliver, which is the name of the fulfillment company ran into a huge buzzsaw. Within a year, Shopify sold off Deliver. They just waved the white flag. <laughs> it takes more than just having a fulfillment network. And on the, on the Amazon side, they've done a lot of investment on the fulfillment. So that's, I think, from, from when I look at it, the exposure is there for TikTok. They definitely have the resources, the capital. Can they pull off the fulfillment? This is the why people love Amazon, the Prime logo, the next day shipping, the second day shipping, and all the benefits you get from Prime. If TikTok pulls this off, it's going to be a, I think it's going to, going to force some change at Amazon one way or another, because um, I don't think they could sit on the sidelines quietly and let uh, their market share erode. All right. So there is no magic. The magic The magic, here's where the magic is. And let me break down what I think is magic. The magic is putting the odds in your favor. And now there's ways that you can put the odds in your favor on Amazon and therefore allow you the greatest chance for success. So there's a couple of things that you want to be able to master and definitely dive into as quickly as possible. As we mentioned earlier, FBA, that's a program that is where Amazon is putting all of their chips and they put their thumb on the scale so that FBA uh, inventory is seen more. Listings strategy. How can I make my listings shine? There's a bunch of different strategy. We're going to get to some of those in part two. Inventory management. This is where on previous episodes, we talked about the graveyard to companies like Toys R Us and Radio Shack. And we have a whole long list of that on a previous podcast. The graveyard was built by inventory mismanagement. And it's very easy to, for things to go off the rails when we're talking about inventory. So it's really one of those things that you can control much better than other aspects. But inventory management has got to be key to your success. Pricing, pricing strategies and being profitable bundling. We're going to get to bundling in part two. There's some things you can do as a reseller, uh, retail arbitrage, or even if you want to call yourself a wholesaler, there's things you could do around bundling that can put the odds in your favor. I mentioned brand registry. This is a, the way to unlock some of those keys that are unavailable if you're not brand registered. And that's where Amazon puts a lot of their investments on the platform. You have to be brand registered. So something definitely to consider. Now, once you leave these things, there's some other things that also contribute to success and that also put the odds in your favor. Those are images. Images on your product really dictate the action people take because that's what they're going to see when you do a search. The first thing they're going to see is your image, your main image. They may read the title, but that image, it has to stand out. And there's a number of ways to do that. And a lot of folks, if you search online, have a lot of strategies around images and what to do and how to do them with, but you cannot sleep on images. The next three also are important. And for us have been really important as we've grown a total team effort. And what I mean by that is that if you're starting your side hustle, at some point, you're going to need someone else. And that's usually the scariest thing when you grow and you add that first employee or that first virtual employee, looking at how to build a team and finding out how others have done that will become important as you grow. So it's a total team effort. And the, and the reason why, and I'm, let me back up for a second. The reason why I say a total team effort, I've talked to brands that are multi-billion dollar multinational brands. And I have found, I had four or five that are in my head right now that I've talked to. 
the team that they've put together on Amazon consists of two or three people. And every single one of these, these four or five that I'm thinking right now that I've had conversations with or consulted with, they all have major problems on Amazon. And that's because on Amazon, there's so many different things that happen on a daily basis that require resources, require attention, require mastery. And it's very difficult at the level now, at the level of a multinational organization to be able to say, I've got three people on the, on the assignment of Amazon, all the boxes are checked and everything should be fine. You're in for a rude awakening at that, especially at that level. Now, two or three, you're getting started, you're side sizzle, it's going to, it's going to be fine, right? And eventually you may even grow beyond the two or three, five, 10, 15, 20, 40, 50, and so on. But it's going to take a team effort as you grow. PPC, this is what pay-per-click or Amazon's ads. This is another place that Amazon is putting its thumb on the scale. It used to be that ads covered some of page one. Now, if you go into page one, when you type in a result, you're going to see many, many more ads. And it's getting even harder to surface those organic results that are non-paid. So understanding how to use PBC, and there's a lot of good folks like Ad Badger um, and several, several other folks that are online, my Amazon guy, they can all talk about Amazon. And if you want some recommendations on that, I'd be glad to uh, provide, just send us a, a query through social media and we'd be glad to recommend some folks. But understanding that, and actually, I would say have some of that knowledge of what it takes yourself. You don't have to be the masters of it, but having an understanding of how PPC works and how it impacts your listings and how it impacts the velocity and visibility is something to really have as part of your toolkit, as part of your roadmap. And lastly, this is the area that some folks um, ignore. And I don't want you to ignore this because as you grow, you will find that your success will also draw both folks that can create honey for you, as well as the bears that want to suck the honey right out from under you. Having good legal advice on Amazon is very important because there's actions that Amazon takes on a daily basis that can negatively impact you, as well as brands that you're reselling can also negative impact you. Don't assume that Amazon, as well as the big multinationals, and this is talking from my own experience here, that they have a command of the laws. Let me give you an example. During this summer, Amazon implemented the verification program. And when we went through the verification with Walmart, for example, it was literally three check boxes. And in two minutes, it was over, done, approved, done. Amazon is under the same exact rules to comply as Walmart, but Amazon did not implement the verification program in a similar way. It was a complete disaster and everybody internally at Amazon knows it. And I've talked to many people internally, they all admit the same thing. And so a lot of things happened that shouldn't have happened. People had their organizations were not getting paid for months, weeks. Um, and, and nobody knew what was going on. And so a lot of shenanigans like this can happen. If you don't have someone that can understand, Hey, these are the laws. This is what you're entitled to. This is what Amazon can do to you. Um, they, they being Amazon operate mainly under the BSA business service agreement. That's what they, they, they will use as their Bible. Brands operate under a whole different, um, set of rules. And sometimes those rules are in conflict with the priorities of Amazon. And so as you grow, you're going to get a lot of arrows flung at you. Um, and we're going to cover some of this on part two as well on how to protect yourself a little bit better. But the legal advice you get is really important. So having somebody on your corner that you can pick up a call, type, send a message to, Hey, I'm having this problem. What are their suspensions or trademark violations or any of these other problems that arise on Amazon, having the right legal advice will, will help you sleep better at night because they know 
what brands can and cannot do legally to you, as well as what Amazon can and can't do to you as well. Can't stress that enough. Dave, you want to add anything on that? Listen, I'm just so thankful that you have the right people in our corner representing us because I'll tell you, these multinational brands, hey, these are multi-million dollar organizations. They billions have in some cases. Billions in some cases. You know, attorneys for them come easy. Uh, and they're threatening sometimes. And they, you know, they like to send letters and kind of scare you a little bit. And when you have the right people in your corner that really understand the laws around being a reseller, what's lawful, what isn't, um, it gives you kind of that upper edge. You feel more confident with some of the leverage and the information that that you're getting from the attorneys on on this side of things. You just you just touched on seven key items. That, that could be seven separate episodes. Oh, right easily, now. easily. We could we could easily dive into all of these, and they all could be standalone podcasts because um, and and we're not doing it justice. But in for the sake of time, these are all. I think aspects that are important to keep in mind, especially for folks that are starters or, or at the beginning, at the starting line, right? With, with their, their journey of selling products online. So let's also, let's, so let's continue this discussion on the other aspects that folks should be aware of when they're trying to get their side hustle going, especially on Amazon. You touched on this already. Lots of competitions, lots of competition on brand listings. So let's, let's break that down real easily. Let's say you're selling a Bose headset or a Nike footwear oh. and you go to sell that product. What you have to do is what's called create a listing. So a listing is a product page. Now you can go and create it yourself, but the lot of times what sellers will do that are selling these products that are brand names, they'll look for it online and see, oh yeah, somebody already created this listing. I'm going to add my business to the list of sellers that sell this business. Now, something you should know, this is a very, very difficult thing to pull off when it comes to winning what's called the buy box. Because every single day, there are probably a bunch of people that want to sell bows. There are probably a bunch of people and entities that want to sell, I'm just saying Nike footwear, for example. And they will go to the listings where they have the most reviews because theoretically the most reviews have the most traffic. And if there's the most amount of traffic, there's a chance, there's a chance that you may sell your product. I got to tell you, we've been selling on Amazon for almost 13 years and this strategy doesn't always work. It doesn't always pan out because what happens is it's a feast or famine. It may work for a while and someone will come in with cheaper inventory or cheaper priced inventory. So you have to know that. There's a lot of competition for these listings where there are 40, 50, 100 sellers. And if that's the case, you probably won't sell much at all. No matter what the Helium 10 or Jungle Scout uh, um, tool tells you, you got to win the buy box. And if the lowest price wins, you, that may not be you. And that may not be you for a while. So understand that. And that leads to copycats and hijackers. Let's say you go, there's another route you can go, which is, Let's say you already have your brand registry. You kind of took our advice. You registered your own trademark. You have your own listing. You get it up there. You get that Nike footwear or that Bose headset. And you know, you, you put it in there. Now you may find that there's other sellers that say, wow, Global Tech or what XYZ company is doing so well. I see a bunch of reviews. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get on their listing. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sell the exact same thing. Well, you got to have a way to deal with that. You got to have a strategy for that. You got to prepare for that. And, the, and when you're not selling anything and there's zero reviews, you won't find a lot of copycats and hijackers. The moment you start getting reviews, the moment you have Q&A, the moment the tools like Helium 10 and Jungle Scout see that you have volume on your listing is going to be the day that you're going to really have to reckon with this and having that plan in place now thinking about it even will help you understand the situation when you get there. Otherwise you're going to be throwing your hands in the air and you're like, what the hell is going on? What's <laughs> happening? What do I do? And 
there are different ways to mitigate that. And we're going to touch on those in part two. All right. Now, let's continue, Dave. Or did you want to add something here about copycats and hijackers? Uh, not really. I was I was having a flashback to the height of the pandemic. The products that we're selling are were in high demand, and there was a lot of those types of shenanigans that were happening on our listings. Yep. Yep. We have been Indeed. there. You yes, yep, it's gonna happen. You can guarantee and the more you sell, the guarantee the guarantee goes up to that. Now, next. Other sellers outbidding you for the buy box. I talked about this. This just simply means that if you're selling a product on a website on Amazon, and especially if it's a lot of like it's a lot of reviews, there's other sellers that may, you know, outbid you or lower their price twenty five cents, fifty cents, a dollar. It happens. We've even seen some that will eventually need to lower their price so low that they're losing money. Right. And that's the part that you have to understand when it comes to Amazon. The There's a bunch of fees. The moment somebody clicks add to cart, the average fee is around 15%. So if we were to use a hypothetical example of a $100 item, 15% automatically goes into Jeff Bezos' pocket or Andy Jassy's pocket. Uh, or, or the coffers. So you're already, you go from 100 to $85 just by the add cart button and it's shipping to the customer. So you're left with 85 bucks. Now, what you have to understand is that that item, it's very possible that item could be returned. So from that $85, the actual money you take home could be in the negative if enough returns come through the system and Amazon takes that money out of your pocket. Literally, they will not, they will do kind of a, they will, you have an account with Amazon and they will pull that from your account or they will withhold funding until that balance is paid. So being outbid on a listing happens if you're on a listing with a bunch of other sellers, this is a very high likelihood in understanding all the fees associated with selling on Amazon is really important because that's where you know what your lowest price can be. Don't, don't assume you bought something for a buck. I'm going to mark it up 30% and I'm going to take that home to the bank. Mm -mm. You got to factor a bunch of other things to make sure you are profitable. And at the end of the day, every business, Dave, is there to make a profit. You, that's what you want to do. Every item you sell on Amazon should be as profitable as possible. And that's how you survive 20 years. All right. Now, brand hostility. Dave, this is one where I may need you to resuscitate me in case I have a core. <laughs> okay. I'm here you and you. I have been in the trenches. I've been in the trenches for 20 years. Uh, and I would say it's become even more of a thing the last five years. Brand hostility. What do I mean by that? There's a lot here to unpack. So if you are listening to this right now, take a deep breath with me, grab your favorite drink, cup of coffee or whatever, buckle up. All right, little John. Yeah! All right. <laughs> little John to kick me off here with a little yeah. Here's what's happening. When we started on Amazon 13 years ago, hardly any of these electronic companies were selling their products on Amazon because a lot of them are geared towards the business buyer. And the assumption was there aren't really any business buyers, Dave, on Amazon. Mm -hmm. Right? Uh oh. So they're like, yeah, go ahead. Do what you want. All right, cool. And for us, as I said, you look at what's changing. And what's changing was that, hey, this e commerce thing is taking off. You know what? Buyers want self-service. Businesses don't want to be interrupted. It's harder to take meetings. Fewer people are responding to email marketing campaigns. Fewer people are picking up the telephone when you call them to say, hey, Dave, I got some product for you. Can I come over? Can I pitch it to you? No. So if you're seeing that, you're like, what's happening? This e-commerce thing keeps taking off. 
it's a natural, natural conclusion to think the business buyers are going to gravitate to Amazon because they're making it easy and make it convenient. I can go on there whenever I want and get what I want. That was my bet. So now we start selling. It takes us a while to understand the platform. First year, very difficult. We didn't sell much. But in year number two, oh boy, Dave, we got it going. We start figuring it out. Every month starts going up. Things going in the right direction. Exciting. It gets exciting. <clears throat> I remember the rep that the first time, I, I, I remember telling him, this was right before Thanksgiving. I said to him, right before things took off, I said, if you guys will take a chance with us, and you're willing to, to, to do this with us, I think we can make it very, very interesting. And we're both win. The rep was like, awesome. Love it. And guess what? His commission check, doo -doo -doo, he was super happy. <laughs> he was loving us. Here's what happened. He got to a point in helping us out in being successful on the platform. That's why you want to be partnered with a company that has a roadmap. In their case, they didn't know, but we'd been selling for a while. But he started seeing success internally. The politics that was happening that we were unaware of at the time it, it came down to some big problems internally because the numbers that he was putting up every month, month after month after month, because he's getting paid on what we're selling uh, or essentially buying from them via wholesale. Other reps internally at this multinational were also wanting in on the action. They, they thought, and this was told to me later on, much, much, much later. We didn't know at the time this was happening that there are other reps inside the company that wanted a piece of the action. And they didn't have any sellers that were doing what we were doing, so they wanted a piece of the action because it is not an easy thing to do. And so they wanted to separate our account and do all these things internally that would have made it much more difficult. So internal politics is a real thing, no matter how large the company, because at the end of the day, the guy or gal that's going to be your manager, if you're working directly with the manufacturer, if they're making bank because you're selling and they're helping you, guarantee you at some point, maybe some other director in another region says, I don't know if we want them on Amazon. And the more successful you sell, the when you start climbing into the millions like we have, the more likely some Everybody else says, I want those millions coming through my territory. Yep. Um, what am I, why am I saying this? Because this is real. And this has happened time and time and time again as a reseller. It's different if you create your own brand, you, you, know, you make your own products, you're your own kingdom. But when you're reselling and you start selling in the millions, you will see that for those organizations that don't have a clearly defined roadmap on how to treat Amazon, this will happen. And so one rep has a, a particular politics or director or manager, general manager. They have a direction. Somebody comes in, they say, we're going in another direction. Let's rub out everybody that's on Amazon. We're going to, we got it here, Dave. We got it covered. We got it covered, Dave. Like what? 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 We got it covered, Dave. You're selling millions now. We'll take over. Don't worry about it. You can go over here on the sidelines, right? Thanks for building up that uh, online community for us and selling all that. But we'll take it from here. And then what are you going to do? Well, there's some hard decisions to make at that point. And fortunately for us, we had the great fortune at some point to be able to have those conversations with some of those entities and say, hey, look, really, it's in your best interest for us to work together. We have some insights that are not available um, to a manufacturer. Because like I said earlier, sometimes manufacturers don't allocate the resources. And, and with a team of two or three as a multinational devoted to Amazon, it's just not enough. Really, at that level, it's just not enough. So understand that brand hostility is real. They can send you nasty letters. That's why you need somebody that is a, uh, an attorney 
that is in your corner that understands Amazon and understands the law, both, not just the law, but Amazon and the law, because they're two separate things. And you want somebody in your corner that can advise you legally on what your rights are, especially when things get hostile. Dave, have I missed something? You want to jump in? I'm kind of biting my tongue a little bit. Um, <laughs> we got to be careful here, right? We just got to be factual, right, about the situation and about what's happening, right? I, I, would, I would just throw this out there to the multinational brands. If you, if you, if there's a partner out there that is representing your product well with value, um, if their pricing is in line with the marketplace, so I'm just saying, you know, if they're, if, if that, if the pricing's not a few dollars over cost, if they're creating content, if they're taking professional photos, you might have a lot to learn from them. Don't don't be scared of that partner. Like Rolando just mentioned, it could be a real great, you know, a win-win scenario. There's people out there that admittingly they don't bring a ton of value to the brand. But there's also organizations that they're in a niche market, they understand the solutions, they know how to support it. They're not driving down the value by dragging that price down mm -hmm. instead of being hostile have true business conversations with those people and if you have a few people that are part of your multinational sales team that are assigned amazon along with 30 other accounts you're 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 doing yourself a disservice don't be hostile. Don't go straight to the attorneys. Go to the organization, sit down, talk about it. There might be a business strategy that you're just not open to because you're just too fearful or you're not knowledgeable enough about the, about the platform. Um, there's good players and there's bad players. Yeah, they're not all the same. They're not everybody not on Amazon is the same. Don't put them all in the same basket. You might be losing out on an opportunity for you to grow your brand and to take market share away from your brand competitor. Absolutely, Dave. You know, the, the game, if, if you were to ask me, and then I've had conversations with some of these brands, um, the game on Amazon today, it's all about digital real estate. 100%. How much of that digital board do you occupy? If you only have one listing or two listings and you own the entire thing on those listings without the, let's call it ammunition from other authorized sellers that can work the game like you can, then you're missing out because although you may control your listings, if we had a hundred global techs that were doing what we're doing, we conquered the digital space on Amazon. We own it. So somebody's going to land on one of those 100 global techs and just like in Monopoly, boom, they got to pay you. And the idea is, could I blanket page one and two? Why just two listings? Why just two results on page one? You can't, can you win with two results? Absolutely. But why not the whole thing? Why not page one and two? And so when you look at how Amazon operates and now, and that's why ads are all over the place because they understand that the digital real estate for them is to control who's there. And right now they're doing it through ads. So it's harder and harder to show up on page one. So why not have the best strategy possible to conquer as much of the page ones out there for your product as possible? And you can do that when you have allies that are also working together with you to create great listings, like you're saying, great product images. And they're working together. And it's a win-win situation. And quite frankly, you know, Dave, if we were to do the, the math here, I'm going to just talk to the brands here for a moment. You do the math, dollars and cents. Every company that sells through distribution or sells through wholesale, a legitimate wholesaler like Ingram and, and all of these other big players, every manufacturer makes more money when they sell in this manner, then then when they sell direct to Amazon, 
and they sell through the 1P program. They don't have control of the listings. They don't have control of the pricing. And it's expensive for most brands. So if you can make more money and be more profitable, but at the same time manage and have a roadmap for Amazon as a, as a manufacturer, it can all work out for you. You just have to have the, the resources in place, the people in place, and the roadmap so that it works for, for the brand and also for the uh, channel plot partners that are part of the program. So, all right. I could go on and on with war stories about brand hostility, but I <laughs> want to get to the next, which is what happens on Amazon when you do try to get on and then you're not able to put up the listing. You're not able to um, get there because they're asking for documentation. So what happens on Amazon when you try to get your or a product or you're reselling a product, sometimes they request letters of authorization they may request proof of invoices. And uh, sometimes you may have to submit that two or three times because sometimes the people that are taking that information are doing copy and paste. There's not always the incentive to go through the information properly. And that's happened to us. You show these are legitimate um, distributors that are within the ecosystem or the supply chain that you've, you've purchased them. And someone in, you know, oh, we can't, we can't understand that. Sometimes the formatting, there's all kinds of little things that happen and, and, and you may have to submit information more than once or twice. So know that that can be a challenge if you're reselling and you're no matter what brand, some brands um, will also put up a little bit of a fight. But at the end of the day, what Amazon is really trying to protect, they're trying to protect themselves from counterfeiters that are getting on the platform selling um, products that are not original product. That's what Amazon's trying to protect themselves. And so you may have to go through a few steps in order to get the listing turned on or even to get on the listing. Dave, anything else you want to add? There's nothing else I can add there. You said it, you said it as best as anybody. That's right. Okay. Well, the other, the last thing I want to leave you with, because it is important to know Amazon is always recruiting more, more uh, businesses. Ori, give me this infographic here with the information. This is, this is the, this is going to show you how as for those that are watching us online on YouTube or anywhere else where the video is being played, there's a pyramid structure on Amazon of sellers at the very bottom that from 2022, this is comes, this comes from marketplace pulse. They were able to get some information on three P sellers, three P third party sellers like ourselves that roughly 23% of the sellers out there are making at about hundred thousand dollars a year in sales annually. Now I got to tell you after you pay the bills, <laughs> After Amazon takes all its fees, that does not leave much for you as a seller. That's the side hustle. <laughs> That's a side hustle. Absolutely, Dave. That is a side hustle. Now, as you grow and you sell, let's say at the million dollar level, at, as of 2022, only 4%, 4% of all sellers, roughly 60,000 or so, achieved one million dollars in sales. You move up the, the pyramid a little bit more, five million a year. And I think that's between the one and five is where things can get very interesting if you're a, if you're moving your side hustle to a business. And now once you move up from there, between that five and ten million, this is where things get even more interesting because at this point you should have a well-rounded team. Uh, you have mastery of the different elements and components within Amazon. So you can get to that between that five and 10 million mark and the 5 million, uh, 5 million and above club is less than 1%. It's 0.63 of all sellers. You move to the $10 million club, it's 0.22 of all sellers. So again, less than 1%, a quarter of 1%, really. And then the real big behemoths, we're talking 
a hundred million or more. There's, there's, there's some out there, but they only represent 0.003 of all the sellers on the Amazon platform. So you could see how hard it is to get to a level where you're really Dave sleeping through the thing. And you know, the money's pouring in. I don't think that a hundred thousand dollars, the money's pouring in because if you extract all of Amazon's fees, the cost of goods, the taxes and everything else, there's not a lot there. So at a hundred thousand dollars on the in the Amazon world, like you said, it's still a side hustle. It's not yet a robust business because there's a lot more that you could do and take it higher than that. I'd like to see a pyramid like that. That's, you know, everyone talks about sales. Um, margin of profit seems to be a, a secondary con a conversation, maybe not as sleek or sexy, but I would like to see that on the margin side. What percentage of Amazon sellers are making the percentages of, of margin? It's my suspicion that some of these multinational brands that may be part of that pyramid on the higher on the higher end of sales, that their profits might be much lower than people realize. Well, we don't have to go too far. Look at the headlines recently. The aggregator space, which bought a lot of these million dollar companies, half a yeah. million, five million dollar companies, they're struggling. Some have declared bankruptcy. Some are being sold to other businesses. Some are exiting the business. And the idea was that these group of folks that are at the aggregators, they have the smart people, they have the spreadsheet guys, they have the MBA guys, and a lot of them are waving the white flag. Not that mm -hmm. these people are bad or anything, but it is a much harder thing to get that, that $5 million level, $10 million, obviously $100 million. There's only like 50 uh, 3P sellers, according to this research. So it is a very hard road. You can do it. You want to be able to stay curious, master all these things, bringing a team of people, and you will get there. Understand, you want to play the long game. That's how you get there. Playing the short game, the black hat, the, the quick money, it's, it's, a, it's a recipe for crash and burning. And uh, the long game is where it's at, and you can get there too. All right, Dave. We've said a ton, and I know for those that have been listening to this point, they're probably wondering, where are all the secrets to getting more information? Well, I got to tell you, you're going to want to listen to part two, because that's where we talk about advanced strategies to get you to seven, eight figures and beyond so that you can take your side hustle into a fully operational, full-blown business on Amazon that will last. So Dave and I will see you in that episode. Have a good day. We'll see you next time.